Hello, this is a discussion about the syllabus. This is universal to all my classes in spring 2024. All right, so let's get started. Certain portions of this syllabus is class specific, mean, name, namely section one and section two. So that means I'm going to start with section three. Now, it doesn't mean that you don't have to read section one or two. It's just that you know, that is specific to each class. So starting with section three, it is information about myself. My first name is Tech, last name is Aoyoung. This is my email address at school, and I, this is the preferred way of communication. I do have a phone number, but most of the time I'm usually not in my office, so leave a message when you want to call me. My office is in the STEM Center in room two, uh, 316, which is on the third floor. My office hours for this particular semester are from uh, on Mondays and Wednesdays. It is in my office from 11 o'clock to noon. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, it is also in my office from 4.30 to 5.30. And then on Fridays, it is in my office from 8 to 9 a.m. If you cannot make it to any, of, any one of these times, you can always you know, schedule a meeting with me you know, through email. There are several important dates that you should pay attention to, <clears throat> and I advise you to go to the academic calendar for those important dates. Those important dates include, but not limited to, are, you know, they include but are not limited to the last day to drop with a refund, the last day to add with a permission number, and also the last day to withdraw with a W notation. So I suggest that you keep track of these dates if you think they are important to you. Also, because this is a face-to-face -face class or in-person class, I'm just going to use the final exam schedule for the college. <clears throat> so that will determine what day and also what time we are going to have the final exam. This applies to both CISP 310 as well as CISP 440 because both are in-person classes. Section 6 talks about presentation and delivery methods. Um, for the most part, you know, the reading material is from the Canvas link. Um, you know, there are links from the Canvas shell that will lead you to the reading uh, material. So just go you know, with that. And I usually just kind of go over the material in sequential order, which means you can always read ahead of time before the lecture. The lectures in this semester is uh, in person, face to face only. Um, I may record lectures. I tend to record lectures unless I forget. Um, attendance is still 100% required. In other words, you know, the recording is more of a resource for people to review the material, but not to skip the lecture. So I do take role in class more on that a little bit later. If you think the recording is useful, please help remind me uh, to start the recording because you know there are occasionally I would occasionally I would forget to click the start button and then nothing gets recorded. Um, synchronous online mode that does not apply. Asynchronous online mode also does not apply because I'm not teaching online classes or even hybrid classes. There will be some interactive activities, especially for CISP 310, because for that particular class, there is a lab section. So more on that a little bit later as well. Section 7 talks about regular effective contact and communication policy. Um, to stay in touch with me, you can utilize office hours, you can email me, you can use the built-in messaging capability of Canvas. And also, you can also check the Canvas course announcements, which typically should be sent to you by email anyway. Um, but if you are not sure, or if you really just want to double check everything, you can always go to the course announcements. The expectation of time frame is um, about a day, you know, no more than 24 hours um, on a business day. So when you submit something, and it is at least 24 hours you know, before the last business day of a week, then you can expect a reply back within 24 hours. And all other time period is going to be about 48 hours of a turnaround time. <clears throat> 
for an in-person class, you know, um, to initiate communication with me, um, I strongly suggest people to come to my office hours, and this is the reason why the office hours are scheduled either right before or right after my lecture and or labs. Um, you can also you know, schedule additional meeting times with me. Um, I'm usually quite flexible, you know, unless I have other meetings and other obligations, you know, I'm usually open to meeting with uh, my students, you know, at you know, any time. <coughs> Well, anytime within reason. Uh, number eight, section eight talks about accommodations. Individuals who can benefit from accommodations can do the following. If you have already contacted the DSPS, which is the Disability Services and Programs for Students, um, you need to let me know about the accommodation requirements as early as possible. <coughs> and you know, right before an exam, you have to uh, start the process at least a week ahead of time. Um, so, you know, when you think, you know, it's about time, you know, when I announce, you know, it's about time for um, an exam, you know, you need to get on to, you need to go to the DSPS and, you know, um, arrange for your accommodation accordingly. Um, and then section nine talks about general conduct in the class. So this is a document that really explains you know, the college, uh, the expectation of behavior and conduct from the perspective of the college. Uh, there's also another guide here. So both of these documents are intended for students to read so that you know what the, the uh, college expects of all students, not just you, but all students. So if you see someone you know, who's doing something that is mm, questionable, um, you can always refer to these documents and find out, you know, whether you know, what to do with those behaviors of other people, not yourself. Uh, the instructor's policy is to be uh, consistent with the expectations from the Office of Student Conduct. Uh, the Office of Student Conduct is going to be reorganized this semester, so I will update all of you uh, about the update. The instructor, being me, will report all cases of violations. The minimum consequence of the violation is a score of zero assigned to the assignment that is in violation. And that is usually only applicable in the case of dishonest, uh, academic dishonesty. In the case of the violations that are not of the nature of the ac academic dishonesty, the instructor can choose to remove the involved you know, people from one or more class meetings. Uh, if you read um, these two documents, um, they clearly state that you know the instructor, being me, you know can ask people you know not to come to class for one or two you know sessions, <coughs> and then the Office of Student Conduct may incur additional consequences. So most of the problems with conduct has to do with academic dishonesty. So we're going to take a closer look at what it is and how I you know, looked at those things. Section 9.1 talks about academic honesty slash integrity, which is from a positive perspective looking at these things. The basis of academic integrity policy is that the grade of an individual, let's say that person is X, should reflect the academic performance of that person and that person alone. Furthermore, the performance assessment should also be conducted in a way that is consistent with the peers of X, which means every student should have you know, the assessment conducted in, a, you know, in the same way. Academic integrity also includes truthfulness in all class-related activities, such as role taking. For example, signing a role sheet for someone else is a violation of academic integrity. Affirming presence when a student is absent in an in-person class is also considered a violation of these new policies. Most assessments include rules that are applied consistently to all applicants. For example, an assessment such as, a, such as an exam may allow the use of any handwritten or printed content on paper, but not electronic devices. Another assessment consistency is the start and the end time of an assessment. Other rules examples include the start time, end time, and answer collection method of an assessment. So whether you write the answer on a paper, you know, on the question paper itself, additional pieces of paper, so those all fall into you know, those uh, restrictions um, that are specific to each assessment activity. 
As such, a violation of the policy happens when the grade or the score of an individual does not reflect the academic performance of that person and that person alone, <coughs> or the participation of the assessment is consistent with the peers of X. Section 9.2 talks about um, other types of you know, conduct expectations. Uh, please refer to the student conduct webpage, which will be, I provided a link earlier. <coughs> the bottom line is that a class, virtual or in-person, should be an environment that is free of elements that impede teaching and learning. In this context, the elements refer to human behaviors, and this is a list of these behaviors, and I'm going to talk about each one you know, in these subsections. 9.2.1 talks about chatting, which occurs you know, in certain classes, not always. So the problem with chatting is it is disruptive to students who are around the people who are indeed you know, who are chatting. So that means you know no matter how quiet the chatters are, chatting is still audible to those people who are around the chatters. Um, conversations that do not relate to the class you know, should not be in the classroom, period. So if anyone needs to talk about something else, either on the phone or with another student in the class, that does not relate to the class itself, um, they can wait until the class is, you know, has ended. They can exchange slips of paper. They can text each other in the class. But you know, doing it in a way that can um, distract you know, other students is not okay. Conversations that relate to a class should be handled, you know, uh, are handled differently. Um, so you know, if someone has a question about something that I said earlier, that person can always raise a hand and ask me about that. Uh, devices are allowed. I don't really get, you know, care whether people are texting in my classes or not. But when the devices you know, uh, make sounds or they buzz you know, or they flash the LED you know, um, and get to the point where it is you know, distracting other people, then it's not okay. So just keep that in mind. And I also strongly advise people to make use of the do not disturb feature of your mobile device so that you know you don't have to remember to turn off the device because you can schedule do not disturb um, periods of time. Other disruptions, um, it is impossible to list or enumerate every possible way of you know, disrupting the class. So if you're experiencing disruption from other people, please let me know because you know, depending on the classroom, in Wave Hall is a huge classroom and sometimes I do not get to see or hear disruptions that people experience, you know, especially at the back of the classroom. 9.2.4 talks about bullying. This college has zero tolerance of bullying. Note that bullying is the act of harming, intimidating, and or coercing another person. So you know, any attempt in doing so is a form of bullying. It can happen, it can happen physically, it can also happen in other forms such as you know, online bullying. If you experience or if you witness bullying, please try to contact, uh, collect as much evidence as possible and report it to me or other college personnel as soon as possible. Um, so uh, the last paragraph here just emphasizes that it can happen on campus physically, but it can also happen electronically, you know, via email and other forms of communication. Um, I can give you one example. You know, it is not uncommon that students will uh, make their own Discord servers um, for classes, you know, to study together, you know, and so on and so forth. That's perfectly okay. But that is also a platform where certain people can bully other people by, you know, uh, doing all of these things, okay? Uh, the act of harming, the act of intimidation or coercion. <clears throat> so when that happens, you know, I cannot see it because, you know, I mean, understandably, I'm not invited to most of these, you know, servers. But if you witness or if you are the target of you know, such behavior, um, collect the evidence, take screenshots, and then come to me and let me know about these things. So related to bullying is uh, threatening. Um, although a component of bullying is threatening, this, se this section addresses the threatening of a person who is not the second party. In other words, this section addresses the case of threatening when the target is a third person. <clears throat> 
So that means, you know, you are witnessing something and someone else is the target. Um, so in these cases, you know, also you'll know, collect evidence and let me know. Um, you know, just uh, you know, finish reading this, you know, uh, this section here because it has happened in the past. And as a result, you know, I have to write this particular section here uh, just to remind people um, this type of threatening is not okay. <clears throat> and also, you know, what kind of consequences can happen when these cases are reported. Section 10 talks about attendance and absences which are pretty easy to understand for in-person classes. You know, there should be no ambiguation whatsoever. You know, what is, um, you know, an absence, what an absence is, I should say. So refer to attendance on the website on, you know, um, college and academic regulations, particularly the district has, you know, these you know, specific requirements. So I would strongly advise you to click on this link and read about it because, you know, I will drop people you know, on the first day of class when they're missing the first class meeting. That is enough reason to be dropped so that your know, people on wait lists, you know, can get into the class. Um, attendance can be tracked by a variety of methods. The idea is every student should be present and on time. In a synchronous or in-person class, this means you know, being late can be counted as absent because you know, that person is missing the activity that I use for role taking. Not paying attention to attendance instruction can also be counted as absent because it is absent in a different way. You know, it's just you know, mentally absent, not physically absent. Each student is responsible to arrange time and other resources to attend lectures and labs on time without interruptions or distractions and pay attention for the entire scheduled duration. <clears throat> Section 10.1 talks about why you know, I want to enforce you know, these policies because attendance is positively correlated with performance and success in a class. Now, does attendance guarantee performance and guarantee a good grade? The answer is no. But I have observations of people who, who miss a lot of classes tend to do poorly in terms of the score and the grade as well. Uh, 10.2 talks about specific to in-person or synchronous online classes. Attendance is, can be taken using specific means as mentioned you know, by the instructor, me. Note that in a synchronous online class, you know, just having a presence in a communication platform does not count. Well, you know, since I'm only teaching in-person this semester, that is irrelevant because I am not going to allow people to attend classes via Zoom in, you know, uh, in an in-person class. 10.3 talks about what is considered excessive. So if you look at one of those links earlier, the district basically put the threshold at 6%. Yes, 6%, which is a little less than 1 16th. So that means in a 16 week class, <clears throat> missing you know the equivalence of one week's worth of classes is excessive so you know, because both cisp 310 and cisp 440 both of those classes meet twice in a week so that means missing two classes is already considered excessive <clears throat> So that's basically what the rest is trying to uh, express here. And I made a mistake here. This is not, <coughs> this is not six and uh, one over 14. Um, in fact, you know, that should be expressed as you know, percentile. So I am going to fix it, you know, soon. Um, what about excused absences? Um, so with excused absences, there's no such thing as excused abs absences. Um, I cannot find any policy whatsoever um, that pertains to Title V, you know, which dictates you know, the operation of community colleges that talk about you know, what would be considered as excused absences. So without any college or district-wide you know, document um, that talks about you know, excused absences, Instead of doing that, instead of saying, okay, this absence is excused, that one is not, and I'm just going to count, you know, the ones that are not excused. Instead of doing that, I'm going to give everybody a certain allowance of absences. 
and I don't really care about the reasoning. So this is another thing that I have to fix here. Um, you, everybody can have up to four absences before I count the next one, which is the fifth one, as being excessive. As you might remember earlier, um, two absences is really already excessive using the district zero definition of 6%. So having four, an allowance of four absences is quite generous. Um, and in these cases, I don't even want, I don't even ask about the reason why someone is missing. It's, it's like, okay, you know, um, someone is missing one class, it counts as one of the four allowed uh, allowances of absences. And I have to update this section here a little bit because I think uh, before I was using only using <coughs> excuse me before I was only using an allowance of you know three absences and now I'm bumping it up by one so you know everybody can be absent you know up to four times you know and then the fifth time is going to be considered excessive. Um, <coughs> So the only time where um, excuses you know, is actually important is when there's an exam. So it's not about lecture, this is about exams. Um, the instructor expects each student to plan ahead and make sure that he or she does not miss an exam or arrive late. This may include, but it's not limited to, setting an alarm so that you wake up on time and get to school on time, plan for alternative transportation, um, you know, just in case your usual, you know, transportation means, you know, it's not working. Accounting for worst case transit time, but schedule disruptions and so on. And also in the case of fasting, uh, conserve energy, drink plenty of water. Fasting is not an acceptable excuse for being absent in an exam. Uh, sickness can potentially be excused if all of the following criteria are met. Because in this case, you know, I don't want to penalize people because they are sick and not being able to make it to an exam. However, in order for <clears throat> a sickness, an absence due to sickness to be excused, there are a few things. One is inform the instructor prior to the exam start time in a reasonable time frame. <clears throat> so that means that if the exam is starting at, let's say, 530, um, you know, I need to be notified, you know, within a reasonable time frame before the start time of the exam. In addition to that, send the instructor a doctor's note prior to the exam. Okay, you know, because, you know, if um, a, a sickness is so bad, you know, that uh, someone cannot go to the exam, you know, because it's contagious or whatnot, <coughs> you know, that probably, you know, warrants, you know, a uh, either a visit to the doctor's office or at least you'll call up, you know, the health provider's, you know, uh, phone number. So, you know, and I think either case, you know, um, a doctor's note can be arranged. <clears throat> the, doctor no the doctor's note must meet all the following criteria. It has to be on paper. Um, so you can take a picture of the doctor's note, you know, that is on paper and send it to me. And I do understand that a lot of your know, health organizations now make use of apps. So you, know, you can actually do a lot of these things, you know, using your app. You can always request the health organization, you know, the HMO, the health management organization, to send you a paper copy of the excuse. Um, if that is not possible, I will also accept an electronic form of the, um, of the doctor's note. The letterhead of a licensed you know, medical facility should be on the paper. So in the case of a screenshot, it's a little bit harder to see that. Um, so in the case of an electronic you know, type of uh, doctor's note, I might request a person to you know, kind of show me in the app, you know, you know, getting to the screen that shows the doctor's note. Um, in other words, you know, my concern is about the authentication of the uh, doctor's note. So the doctor's note should be dated, but not back dated. In other words, you know, if somebody is missing an exam on, let's say, Tuesday, um, and the doctor's note is post dated, is is back dated to Tuesday, but it's actually written on, say, Thursday. I'm not going to accept that. So it has to be dated on the same day of you know the uh, excused um, assessment. 
um, on the doctor's note, you know, uh, that especially for the ones, you know, that are written before an exam, then the range of dates, you know, should be, you know, stated. Uh, for instance, you know, somebody may be sick um, over a weekend and there's an exam on Tuesday. So that person, you know, went to go see, a, went to a doctor on say Saturday. The doctor you know, looked at the symptoms and go like, hmm, you know, I don't think it's a good idea. I think you should, you know, basically rest for a whole week. That's fine. Um, so as long as the doctor's note, you know, specifies from this time, from this date to this day, you know, this individual really should not be going to class, should be resting, that's fine. So I just need to look at, you know, that range of dates, you know, to be excused. At the discretion of the instructor, the instructor may exempt time sensitive uh, criteria if the if the onset of the sickness is has an ac acute nature, such as you know, acute you know, appendic appendicitis. Um, the doctor must note that the medical condition has an acute nature. So in these cases, you know, back dating is okay because you know. <clears throat> you know, there's no way, you know, to predict, you know, when somebody is going to have an acute uh, form of, you know, sickness. But, you know, it has to be uh, qualified by the doctors, you know, in the doctor's note. In the event that the instructor excuses a student from taking an, ex taking an exam on the scheduled day, the instructor may choose to administer an exam that is different from the, from the one administered on the scheduled day. So this is, you know, kind of, you know, a way to make sure that um, when people take an exam, not on the scheduled, you know, day, um, it will still be a fair assessment, you know, compared to the rest of the class. All right, section 11 talks about grading. What is being assessed? Um, an assessment can be a lab activity, a homework assignment, a canvas activity, a quiz, or an exam. For each individual part defined by the assessment, there are some dimensions of assessment. In other words, you know, what, am I what am I testing for? Section 11.1.1 basically says your prior knowledge and the ability to recall is not being tested because all the exams are open book and open notes. So why would I be testing whether someone can remember something when it is already open book and open notes. It doesn't make sense. Section 1.11.1.2 section talks about analysis and critical thinking. Uh, so this is something that I will be testing for. And you know, critical thinking and analysis, mostly when it's applied to exams, is being able to read the exam question and be able to relate that to definitions and concepts that we have talked about in class. Um, I will also test you know, for program, uh, problem solving and synthesis you know, ability. And this one quantifies the ability to utilize you know, definitions, concepts, symbols, procedures, processes that are introduced in the class to actually you know, finish you know, doing something uh, to basically solve a problem in this case. <clears throat> Section 11.1.4 talks about performance, which basically translates to how quickly can something be done. Um, so, you know, the uh, exams, you know, have uh, specific, you know, time limits. So that means, you know, even if somebody, you know, can solve all the problems, given enough time, um, I am only going to score and assign a grade based on what is turned in within the uh, allowed time of the assessment. So, you know, so that means, you know, familiarity and efficiency, they are both important in an assessment. <clears throat> um, each assessment, you know, each piece of each assessment, you know, is graded from zero to four, which is the GPA scale. And, you know, basically, you know, zero out of four is an F. One out of four is a D, two out of four is a C, three out of four is a B, four out of four is an A. And this particular section is really just, you know, talking about, you know, what does it mean for each particular um, number, for each particular grade? I'm just gonna, I'll just pick one that, you know, most people are interested in. Let's say two out of four, what does it mean? 
Well, it means that the submitted work shows sufficient evidence of the ability to analyze and think critically, the ability to synthesize or problem solve. However, the submitted work also shows evidence of one or more conceptual mistakes, even though they are not、uh, critical to that particular、uh, question, but there are conceptual mistakes, and or <clears throat> insufficient familiarity and or efficiency. So、um, you know, that's essentially you know why someone ends up with a grade of C. So some of this you know determination you know between you know a B and a C and you know most you know sometimes a D is a little bit subjective. I try to be as as objective as possible.、Um, but basically you know、um, you know an answer is ranked you know based on you know these criteria. And if you read the differences between these, you know you can basically、uh, see how they are different you know, between the various you know grades. <clears throat> the translation between a、uh, numerical score and the letter grade at the end of the semester is pretty easy.、Um, if somebody is getting twelve point five percent. Uh, excuse me. If somebody is getting less than twelve point five percent at the end of the semester, that person is going to get a grade of F. Between twelve point five percent and less than thirty-seven point five percent is a D, and so on. So that means you know because most classes only, you know, I mean in most、uh, cases, you know people need to get a C or better grade. So that means you know thirty-seven point five percent or more will basically quote unquote pass a class. Uh, late and make a policy.、Um, I do not you know, allow late submission unless you know there is a reason. You know, and you know, someone tell me that reason ahead of time.、Um, it is up to my discretion to decide you know, whether I would accept late submission when there is a reason, and you know that reason is you know, you know, and I know about the reason ahead of time. So it's otherwise you know the policy is no late submission. Eleven point four talks about assessments. You know what kind of work do we do in order to earn the the points? Twenty、uh, percent would go to homework assignments and lab activities. So every all the lab and all the homework assignments add up to twenty percent of the final score. The first and second exam, each one will take up twenty percent, and then the final exam will take up forty percent of the final score. Um, and then the topic schedule is specific to the class, so I'm not going to get into that because it is specific to either、uh, CISP 310 or CISP 440. So that pretty much concludes a、um, kind of verbal description of the syllabus. This does not mean that you don't have to read the syllabus. It simply means that you know I have already gone over that. You know, using a video, but you're still supposed to be re- you, you're still supposed to have read the syllabus on your own because there are hyperlinks inside the syllabus that bring you to some other documents that may be important to you. All right, so I look forward to seeing you in the classroom, and、um, have a nice weekend. You know, before the、uh, semester starts. <laughs>